On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Mitigating Construction Risks in Long-Term Care, a Blueprint for Infection Preventionists. My name is Christine Bingman and I will be your moderator for this program. We welcome any comments or questions and all materials are provided for your educational use. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Amanda Bennett is an infection preventionist for the Patient Safety Authority. In this role, she serves as a resource for Pennsylvania's facilities through education and the development and monitoring of infection pre prevention and reduction initiatives. Ms. Bennett has an extensive background in infection prevention, laboratory testing, analysis and interpretation of diagnostic results, education and regulatory standards. Amanda, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Christine. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar about construction in the long-term care setting. Construction isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind when you think about infection prevention in the long-term care setting, but it is an important element in keeping residents staff, and visitors safe. Throughout this presentation, think about what you already have implemented in your facility and are there addition, additional elements that you need to incorporate. The objectives for today's presentation are recognizing the infection preventionist role in construction and renovation projects within a healthcare setting, identifying common pathogens associated with construction and the infections they cause demonstrating an understanding of the requirements and process of performing an infection control risk assessment, or ICRA, and explaining infection control mitigation strategies to be used during construction projects. The first question we need to answer is what is considered construction in a healthcare setting? The way we're talking about construction comes in many sizes. It can be as small as visual inspection by lifting ceiling tiles, or as invasive as complete unit remodels or new building construction and all types of projects in between. With this understanding, we can begin to discuss what infection prevention has to do with construction. Regardless of the size of the construction or renovation project, it can impact air and water quality within the facility and therefore have an adverse effect on the safety of residents, staff, and visitors. Construction is the ultimate exercise in the separation of clean and dirty. To fully understand the role infection prevention plays in construction, we need to consider the chain of infection. What are the components and how do they interact and impact one another? Next, we're going to look at each of these components individually and where they can be found in construction and renovation projects. The chain of infection consists of six components, the infectious agent, the reservoir, the portal of exit, and the mode of transmission, the portal of entry, and finally, the susceptible host. The first step is an easy one, the infectious agent. Here we're talking about any sort of bacteria, virus, fungi, or yeast. Which pathogens to be most concerned with will depend on your construction and renovation project. The next link is the reservoir. This is where the infectious agent can survive, but may or may not multiply. Commonly, we think of reservoirs as humans, animals, or the environment. During construction, we are most concerned with the environment. Examples of this would be drywall, ceiling tiles, and wall coloring coverings. During demolition, a lot of dust can be stirred up and organisms being harbored underneath or in debris can be circulated. The next link in the chain is the portal of exit. This is the path the infectious agent uses to leave the reservoir. This commonly occurs during the demolition phase when infectious agents can become airborne. Common portals of exit during construction and renovation are openings in walls, doors, ductwork, openings in ceilings, and plumbing. 
the next link in the chain is the portal of exit. I'm sorry, I've got myself switched here. I'm sorry, the next link is the means or the mode of transmission. This is the method by which an infectious agent gets to the susceptible host. During construction, there's a wide variety of routes of transmission. Here we're thinking about different types of fomites that can transport the infectious agent from one area to the susceptible host. Examples include hands, air, water supplies, tools, carts and other equipment, and construction materials, also shoes and clothing of the workers. Our next link in the chain is the portal of entry. This is how the infectious agent enters the susceptible host. While this is not an all-inclusive list, during construction and renovation, the primary portal of entry concerns are inhalation, ingestion, and open wounds. The final link in the chain of infection is the susceptible host. Any person can be a host for an infectious agent, but there are certain groups that are more susceptible. In long-term care facilities, common groups that are more susceptible are the elderly, the immunocompromised, residents who've had recent surgery, diabetics, any person with an invasive device, and anyone with open sores, wounds, or burns. The key to preventing infections during construction and renovation is to break the chain of infection. So how do we do this? This break in the chain can happen at any junction between the links. It just takes stopping one connection to prevent the infection, and it doesn't matter where in the chain of infection this break occurs. This brings us to the Infection Control Risk Assessment, or ICRA. This is a process to assess the impact of construction and renovation work in healthcare facilities on infection control programs and practices and to ensure that new construction is designed to meet the need of the anticipated patient population. Essentially, an ICRA is how you plan for an upcoming construction or renovation project. It's imperative to have buy-in from your administration about the important role infection prevention plays in these projects. That sets up the expectation within your facility that you will be involved in all pre-planning. Pre-planning is the key to successfully execute a construction project from an infection control standpoint. It's always harder to go back and retrofit a project or barriers once you realize there is an issue. It's also easier to do the work up front than find yourself in a bad situation. Once you have an ICRA in place, you can show anyone who comes into your facility, such as the Department of Health, that you've tried to do the process correctly. So now you know you need to do an infection control risk assessment, but what's important to incorporate into your ICRA policy? First, you'll want to find departmental responsibilities. This way, everyone knows what their role is and what's expected of them. Next, you want to lay out the types of work that fall under ICRA requirements. When you're starting out, it's a good idea to be involved in all project planning. Once you and your team are more comfortable it could be possible for smaller projects or projects that happen often to have a set procedure on what is required. You won't know what's feasible until you run through the process. You also need to find ICRA terms. Again, you want everyone on the same page and speaking the same language. A procedure for ICRA compliance lays out expectations and ensures everything in the ICRA will be followed. And finally, a record keeping requirement for the ICRA process. This includes any paperwork that's generated from the process, who will be in charge of the hard copy of the ICRA and permit, where will they be displayed and stored, and if there are paper copies of site inspections or negative pressure monitoring, you'll need to decide how those will be kept. Now we'll talk about the ICRA team. It's important to ensure all the relevant parties participate in the ICRA team. In addition to infection prevention, the ICRA team should include safety, engineering, and someone from the affected area or areas. In my experience, I found the relationships within this team invaluable. 
The most effective way to keep residents and staff in the facility safe is for everyone to be on board during the planning process. When good relationships exist within the team, better communication occurs when new projects pop up and more sharing of information takes place. I've learned more about construction regulations, HVAC systems, and plumbing than I ever thought I would. And the reverse is also true. When I share information about why infection control principles are important and how they protect residents, the rest of the team begins incorporating that into their thought and planning processes as well. They know more what to expect from infection prevention and when to bring us into the discussion. As the IP on the ICRA team, there are a few key points you'll need to consider during the process. Overall, you'll need to assess the needs and risk of residents, staff, and visitors. Address any infection prevention needs of residents and staff that will occupy the space once the construction is complete and provide evidence-based guidance on infection prevention during the design phase. These considerations will vary depending on the scope of the project. During the design phase, you'll want to consider what finishes will be used. Are they cleanable? Are there a sufficient number of hand washing and or alcohol-based hand rub stations? And does their placement make sense? During the construction phase, you'll need to consider how to isolate the dirty construction area from the clean resident or staff area. What barriers and other mitigation efforts need to be put in place to ensure their separation is maintained. Once construction is complete, consider how the space will be used and ensure residents and staff can effectively function in the area while following infection prevention principles. We will talk about these ideas in more details later in the presentation. If you don't have experience working on construction or renovation projects, it can feel a bit overwhelming. When I started in this field, this was one of the most intimidating parts of the job because it felt very outside my scope of expertise. Luckily, there are guidelines that exist to help us. One of the more widely used guidelines is from the Facilities Guidelines Institute. In 2001, FGI mandated an ICRA in the planning and construction process. Then in 2006, requirements were added for written infection control mitigation recommendations, which describe how transmission from construction zones will be contained. To make it more facility specific in 2014, FGI published two editions, one for hospital and outpatient facilities and a second for residential care facilities. They split it further in 2018 with three editions, one for hospitals, another for outpatient facilities, and then a third for residential health care and support facilities. Coming next year, Pennsylvania will be updating the regulations for long-term care facilities. excuse me, beginning on July 1st, 2023, new construction, renovations, and alterations will have to comply with the 2018 FGI guidelines for residential health care facilities. This will include a safety risk assessment for projects, including an infection control measure. This change will essentially require an ICRA for these projects. With this change, it's even more important for IPs to understand how to perform an infection control risk assessment. We will go through each step in the following slides. The template we will be using in this presentation is from the American Society for Healthcare Engineering. Their updated ICRA 2.0 tool was released last year and is available to download from their website at no cost. This is not the only available tool but it is widely used and lays out the process in a very user-friendly fashion. The first step in this tool is to determine the activity type. The types range from A to D as follows. Type A, inspection and non-invasive activities. Type B, small-scale, short-duration activities that create minimal dust and debris. Type C, large-scale, longer-duration activities that create a moderate amount of dust and debris, and then finally type D, which is major demolition and construction activities. 
This is what step one of the tool looks like. As you can see, they go into detail with examples of each type of project. Type A is where you would put your most basic projects, including removing of a ceiling tile for visual inspection, all the way to type B, which is renovation work in two or more rooms and new building construction. I think it's also important to point out the section in type C that I have highlighted. This states that any activity that cannot be completed in a single work shift would automatically be classified as type C. Personally, I've had projects with work I may have considered type B, but had to classify them as type C based on project duration. Continuing to step two, you will be determining the patient or resident risk group. In this step, you're identifying the individual risk group that will be affected. If you have more than one risk group affected, you should select the higher group. The groups are divided into four possibilities. Low risk, which are non-patient care areas. Medium risk, which are patient care support areas. High risk, or patient care areas. And then the highest risk, which are procedural, invasive, sterile support, and highly compromised patient care areas. As with step one, the chart in the tool for step two goes into more details about these groups. Low risk covers any areas that are not care areas, such as public hallways, break rooms, bathrooms, and offices, as long as they are not on clinical units. Medium risk are support areas, or I like to think of them as resident adjacent areas. These are areas where residents aren't located, but are close to residents or contain items that will reach residents. These areas include material management, waiting areas, and the kitchen. High-risk areas are the actual patient care areas. In long-term care, some examples would be resident rooms, medication rooms, and clean utility rooms. You are less likely to find the highest risk group in a long-term care setting. Some examples would be oncology units, transfusion services, or dedicated isolation units. Step three is determining the class of precautions needed for the project. In this step, we put together the information on the construction project type, which can be found at the top, and then you put that with the risk group that we determined uh, down the left-hand side. This determined determination will guide us on the mitigation strategies that need to be taken on the project from start to finish. The class of precautions goes from class one to class five. Class five was added with the new tool updates to add more precise precautions when looking at medium to high risk projects. Step four is also brand new to the updated tool and takes into consideration the surrounding areas and how they will be affected. The best example I've heard to demonstrate the importance of this is if you have an extensive project taking place which requires jackhammering the floor. You can think of every possible risk for the direct area, but you're still going to have a major problem if you don't consider that the jackhammering is taking place on the floor above an operating room. I certainly wouldn't want to be the person on the table when that's occurring. In a less drastic example, and more specific to infection control, we need to be aware of the ventilation in the direct care area and how it's connected to surrounding areas. The HVAC system may need to be contained to ensure organisms aren't being circulated through ventilation to other areas. The tool gives space to consider several surrounding areas and items to consider, such as noise, vibration, dust control, ventilation, pressurization, and impact to other systems. If any of these items are determined to be an impact during your project, mitigation strategies are also listed. After you've completed all four steps, you're ready to move on to putting the recommended, recommended mitigation strategies into place. The last three pages of the ICRA 2.0 tool outlines mitigation activities required for each class of precautions. These outline the minimum required infection control precautions for each class that should be performed before, during, and upon completion of work activities. 
Again, these are the minimum requirements. You're of course always able to put more precautions in place if needed. The second document in this tool is the ICRA permit. This is the document where you transcribe all the determinations you made in steps one through four and include additional details and key risks identified. There is space to include contact information for the construction supervisor and details about the project's start date, completion date, and estimated duration. This document should be posted at the work site so that anyone who enters the facility can see the planning and mitigation steps that have been put into place. It also supplies contact information if an immediate issue arises at the site. Now we're going to discuss specific considerations during the different phases on construction and renovation projects. The first phase we'll discuss is the design phase. You want to account for any necessary isolation rooms for airborne or protective environments. It's also important to consider the number, location, and types of hand washing stations and hand sanitizer dispensers, including plans for hand drying. Individuals can have great intentions to wash their hands appropriately, but it won't happen if we don't ensure they have the necessary equipment in convenient locations. We also want to ensure there's a risk assessment for waterborne pathogens with mitigation measures. It would be a good idea to review the CMS memorandum on the requirement to reduce Legionella risk that I have linked in this slide. As I mentioned before, it's always better to pre-plan, and that includes for what finishes will be used in the final project. We want to make sure finishes are durable, compatible with your facility's cleaning and disinfecting products, and are resistant to moisture damage, both for bodily fluids and also cleaning projects products. While the actual construction work is occurring, we have a different set of mitigation strategies to consider. This includes the location of residents or if they will need to be relocated, if barriers need to be used, and what type you will put in place. Construction phases. What are they? How long will each phase take? And what different types of work will take place during each phase? traffic flow, exit access, and operation of life safe safety system. Also any required training, considering both construction and facility staff. Construction worker areas, new material requirements, and project monitoring. Now on to the completion of work phase. The construction work may all be done, but our work in infection prevention is not. During this phase, the goal is to ensure any mitigation strategies that were put into place are safely removed. The area is cleaned and ready for residents and or staff to utilize the space. During this time, work area cleaning will take place. Any critical barriers will be removed. The function of any regulated required negative air will be checked and HVAC systems will be ensured to be in working order. If the project was found to be a class three, four, or five, the area must be checked by an infection preventionist and engineering before any ICRA precautions can be downgraded or discontinued. Now that we've gone through how to complete an ICRA and what mitigation strategies are involved, let's talk about some pathogens of concern. The two pathogens that come to mind first for construction are Aspergillus and Legionella. Aspergillus is a fungus that is ubiquitous to the environment. It can be found anywhere, soil, household dust, building materials, plants, food, and water. This is why it's such a concern during construction when you're demolishing areas that may not have been touched for extended periods of time and stirring up a lot of dust. It is transmitted through inhalation and can cause death in 50% of infected individuals with weakened immune systems due to antifungal resistance. <clears throat> in an immunocompetent host, it can cause localized pulmonary infections if there is an underlying lung disease, allergic bronchopulmonary disease, and allergic sinusitis. In an immunocompromised host or an immunosuppressed host, it can cause invasive pulmonary infections 
and the infection can disseminate to other organs. The second pathogen of concern is Legionella, especially if the construction project includes a plumbing component. Legionella is a gram-negative fastidious bacteria that causes Legionnaire's disease and Pontiac fever. It is spread through small water droplets or aerosolization or aspiration. It can be found in collections of stagnant water and can live and grow in biofilm. The case fatality rate can be as high as 33% for healthcare-associated Legionnaire's disease. Two other key points for construction and renovation projects are negative pressure and construction debris. If negative pressure is required, it's important to ensure there is negative pressure from the construction zone relative to the surrounding areas. This will prevent the release of airborne infectious agents from the work area into the clean area. This slide shows a diagram of the proper negative pressure flow. You want air to flow from the clean area into the construction area, and then ideally outdoors. If the air cannot be exhausted outdoors, or it's exhausted outdoors near an intake or a common pedestrian traffic area, it should first pass through a HEPA filter. We've discussed multiple times already the risk construction debris can pose. But what do you need to do to ensure you keep this debris from creating an issue in your facility? First, all clothes and tools need to be cleaned before leaving a contaminated area. The use of tacky mats when exiting the site should also be in place. There should be a dedicated traffic route away from residence areas for workers, supplies, and debris. When it comes time for debris removal, a trash chute is ideal. If a trash chute isn't possible, the debris can be removed in carts that are tightly covered and their exterior needs to be cleaned. We'll now run through some scenarios to show real world examples of how to apply the ICRA 2.0 tool. In our first scenario, we have the remodel of 13 rooms in a skilled nursing unit, which will include painting, new flooring, and complete installation of new bathrooms. The project should take six weeks. Residents in the remaining rooms cannot be relocated and will remain in the unit. Key points in this scenario are multiple rooms being remodeled for an extended period of time, and residents located within the same unit will not be relocated. When we consider the construction project activity, it would be classified as type D, with major demolition and construction activities taking place in two or more rooms. The activity is taking place in a resident care area, which makes our risk group high risk. With this information, we know this project requires class five precautions. Other important items to consider are how we block off the hallway where these rooms are located to be completely blocked from the rest of the unit that will still be housing other residents. How will this work impact exits and the general flow of traffic? Will you still, you still need the ability to have safe exits and workflow within the rest of the unit? How will the noise from this project impact other residents in the unit? During what hours will the construction take place? This is when a representative from the unit will provide valuable information. You'll need to understand the general schedule of that unit. Where will the HEPA exhaust be directed? Can it go directly outdoors or will it need to exhaust indoors? Where will you fit the ante room? With class five level precautions, an ante room is required. It needs to be large enough for equipment staging, cart cleaning, and workers. It should be situated adjacent to the entrance of the construction work area. Our second scenario is a much smaller project taking place in, much, in a much different area. In this scenario, the faucet in the lobby bathroom has been leaky for months, and after several attempts to repair, the decision has been made to replace it. The project should take one to two hours to complete. Key points in this scenario are the location of the bathroom 
and the short duration of the project. When we consider the construction project activity, it should be classified as type A, with clean plumbing activity, which is limited in nature. The activity is taking place in a non-resident care area, which makes our risk group low risk. With this information, we know this project requires class one precaution. Other important items to consider are what are the surrounding areas aside from the lobby. This is a fairly limited project, but if it will create noise, maybe it's best to plan it during a time when most residents are awake. Once the project is complete, it's important to ensure that all surfaces are cleaned before putting the bathroom back into use. A final consideration with any plumbing work is your facility's policy surrounding aerators. Current guidance suggests avoiding aerators in hand-washing sinks. If aerators are used, there needs to be a strict cleaning schedule. In our third scenario, we find ourselves more in the middle ground. The electrical in the kitchen needs to be replaced. The project will be completed in one shift, but they will need to have multiple ceiling tiles open at the same time. Key points in this scenario are the location of the project, the duration of the work, and that multiple ceiling tiles will be open at the same time. This construction project activity will be classified as type B, with work being conducted above the ceiling, which will produce minimal dust and debris. The activity is taking place in a resident care support area, which makes our risk group medium risk. With this information, we know this project requires class two precautions. Other important items to consider are when will this work be completed? Can it be done overnight or at a time when food isn't actively being cooked? Where in the kitchen is it taking place? If it's happening in a storage area or away from active food prep, precautions may be slightly different than if it's directly over the cooking or prep areas. With this project, you'll want to monitor the area after project completion to ensure it's ready to be actively used again for resident food. On this slide, I've included some resources for you. First is the Facilities Guideline Institute guidelines. We know that beginning in July of next year, in Pennsylvania, new construction, renovations, and alterations will have to comply with the 2018 FGA guide, FGI guidelines for residential healthcare facilities. Next is the link for the ICRA 2.0 tool and permit. And finally are the CDC links for aspergillosis and Legionella. Of course, you always have the three IPs at the Patient Safety Authority, Joanne, Christine, and myself, to use as a resource. And this slide includes our contact information. I'd now like to introduce our guest expert here to help with any questions you may have. Charlie Schlegel is the Director for the Division of Safety Inspection at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. He has over 20 years of experience in the health care safety inspection arena, working in private industry as well as state government. Charlie is currently responsible for all life safety code inspections and plan reviews for new construction, renovations, and alterations for approximately 2,000 healthcare facilities throughout Pennsylvania. Charlie, is there anything that you would like to add to the presentation or comment on? Feel free to do so. Uh, so thank you, Amanda. So first, I would like to thank Amanda for an amazing job um, going through the process, and then also, um, you know, the the fact that the Patient Safety Authority, uh, you know, understands that um, there is a, a direct correlation with a lot of things that the Department of Health does. Um, so that is is great. So the the link is great. Um, so it's very important to understand, um, that, you know, I understand that we're, we've been through COVID and we're not doing much, but now we're coming out of COVID. There's a lot of renovations and things that are going on. And this is important information to understand so that when we do the construction, you're not getting cited by the Department of Health. It's, um, you know, it is um, one of those things that we want you to be in compliance and 
Amanda went through the steps to to do so, uh, especially with um, you know everything with you know construction and infection control, and she uh, sent you the link. I think I can only add um, that sometimes we would try to make um, so if you're doing a renovation of a wing or or things like uh, like that that we try to make it fun for residents where we can maybe put plexiglass so they can see what's going on. So I know that's not a patient uh, safety, you know, you know, part, but it's resident, uh, you know, satisfaction. So they can, um, you know, see inside, uh, but you're still, you know, blocking uh, anything that would be coming out of that unit for construction to the units that are you know, being occupied for residents, but there is, an, uh, you know, a lot of overlap between infection control and the, the things that we do um, for construction and uh, plan review and occupancies. So it's very important to, to keep those things uh, in mind. Um, so we added the, the the links for infection control. There's also chapter 43 in NFPA 101, the 2012 edition, which is currently used for state license and federal certification to try to guide you for you know, what type of um, precautions you need uh, to take um, when you're doing construction. I think, um, you know, so far, um, you know, you know, what you have is a, is a great, uh, basis. And if you have any questions to contact myself or your field office at, um, you know, DSI or DNCF to, if you have any questions to ask, you know, if there's something else you should be doing. Thank you so much, Amanda and Charlie. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. So uh, we have a couple of questions already. Um, one of those being, if you have no experience in construction activities, where would one seek information or education to advance their knowledge in this field? I think from my experience, uh, the APIC uh, organization is a great place to turn to. The listserv is a great place to connect with other IPs, depending on your area. I know my area actually has a long-term care group that you can go to. Also, I think that talking with the people within your facility, I have learned the most from uh, maintenance plumbers in my facility. They are really willing most times to walk you through projects. Uh, those would be my two biggest places that I have I have had education in this field. Is there any formal education that a person could attend? I believe that APIC does also have some uh, education offerings on this. I don't know, Charlie, if you have any input on where formal education can come from for this. So I'm thinking the um, I'll have a check. There, there are some things through the um, FGI where there's the um, there's there's a group that does uh, uh, centers for design. I have to look up their their information, but I think they're very much into the uh, safety risk assessment, which includes this. So I can provide that at uh, uh, if we can send it out to the participants. Charlie, what about uh, the carpenters union? Do they offer ICRA training across the state? Uh, not so much. Um, so I think the important thing is if you're a, a facility, uh, so we've been using infection control risk assessments since um, early 2000s for like hospitals and surgery centers. It's been a little bit slow to catch on and, and long-term care to, in my opinion. Um, so if you use a contractor that's familiar uh, with working in healthcare, they're already going to know these principles and and already institute them. 
Um, so it's important to always use somebody that's um, healthcare familiar uh, or somebody that can you know catch on quickly so that you can be in compliance with with all these uh, you know different things that might affect your facility because you don't want to do construction and have someone get sick or uh, there are other issues or you know that type of thing. Another question. How often should an IP go to check on a construction project? So I would say this really depends on the project and also your experience working with uh, whoever is doing the construction. Like Charlie said, if you're using someone who is familiar with healthcare or you have worked with them in the past, uh, you'll have more confidence in the work that they're going to do. So I would say upfront, it's important to go as often as possible. You know, Every day, walk through. Uh, if you see an issue, make sure you come back to follow up on it. And then, um, of course, as the project is coming to a close, you want to make sure that everything is being handled the way that you talked about with your mitigation strategies that you put in place. Um, for right. larger projects, it may be more often. Yeah, so I uh, definitely agree that at least daily. And then if they are showing that they're doing the right thing, maybe you could you know, push that out, but at least start at daily or more. When a construction project has been completed, what are the steps required or mandated prior to that area being used? Uh, so if sorry. it is, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Amanda. So, um, so, uh, for a long term care facility, you're going to have to go through the occupancy process. Which would include going to, um, uh, my group at DSI, uh, to do the 1st survey. Um, and then getting the uh, DNCF to come out separately. And then once both groups do their surveys, then you can use the space. If you're an infection preventionist in an institution, long term care. And the individuals that are planning the construction do not invite you to the table to be a part of those discussions. How do you handle that moving forward once you find out that there is an event or a construction project go ongoing? So that's a hard situation. I've definitely been in that situation before myself. And I think that the most important thing is to get the administration on board that you need to be involved because that really sets the stage for everyone else. I also think, uh, you know, once you get yourself involved, I think uh, infection preventionists quickly prove their importance and bringing up issues, even if sometimes uh, I think we make things a little bit harder than people would like. Uh, but I do think that there is recognition once we're part of the conversation, what role we play. And so I would, I would just say again, to go back to the administration and that's, that's where that all really needs to start. They set the stage for what's going to happen on future projects. Do the uh, colleagues in the environmental services department play a role in construction and renovation activities? I would say they absolutely do. I think that they are involved in getting the space prepared. Uh, depending on how you have things set up at your facility, they may be the ones that's doing some of the final cleanup. And they also know, you know, what, what the baseline is, I, I, for lack of, lack of better words, where you would expect your facility to be, what is normally required for residents and care areas to be able to be used. So I think they definitely play a very important part. I would fully agree. Yes, thank you. Looks like there's some questions too in the Q and A box. Does the patient safety authority provide access to the FGI guidelines for long-term care facilities to access, or do they have to purchase? You can get a uh, free access, and um, I can provide that um, at that site. It's a little bit tougher. You can only see like you know certain parts of the page and that type of thing. I would um, definitely recommend that every facility, you know, ha uh, have a copy of the codes that they are being uh, enforced in their facility, 
So I do the same thing with NFPA 101 uh, that um, my folks enforce and, you know, FGI 2018 coming, you know, this July 1, 2023. Uh, but um, come 2023, uh, July 1, I would recommend everybody having that uh, as well, but there is free access that we can provide. Uh, that's provided by FGI. How about asbestos or lead during construction? Is that something we should watch as infection preventionists? So for asbestos or lead, you know, they're not necessarily infectious agents that completely fall under an IP, but I do think those are important things to consider. Uh, when you're working in a well-rounded team, I think it's always a good idea to bring up concerns, even if they don't fall in, in your area of expertise, it can get the right people thinking about it. So I'm not sure that we would be the ones leading the charge on that, but it never hurts to bring up any concerns you have because someone else may not be thinking about it. Right, they should really uh, be brought up to be sent to like either OSHA or labor and industry. So the they're very important. That's, uh, but like in this group, um, yeah, if you see it, it should be brought up because um, there are a lot of things that you have to do to mitigate those factors. Thank you. Does the Patient Safety Authority provide any documents for long-term care on how to navigate a construction process within Pennsylvania? or checklists they could utilize to include when plan review or occupancy inspections are required. So at the PSA, we don't have any documents specific for long-term care and in construction, but I do think that the ICRA 2.0 tool that we looked at here, which is available free to download from their website, and we have the link in the webinar, would really be the best thing to guide you through the process. I also, you know, we have the three IPs on our team who are always willing to go through these projects with you, either, you know, over the phone or coming out to your facility if you'd like us to walk with them and see what you've put in place or specific questions uh, that you may have. We're always here for that. And then as far as uh, plan review or occupancy inspections, Charlie, you might know better than me for this, but I would say those FGI 2018 guidelines are what we really should be using since that is going to be the standard that we are measured against starting next year. Right, and, and we do have some processes that are in place. So if there, if there are questions or um, maybe this is something that um, they would like to, to have another webinar on just in reference to, you know, how to, to, to schedule. Uh, that's something we could talk about, but there, um, there are a lot of things in reference to, um, uh, you know, how to schedule an occupancy and, you know, what codes are required and, and, you know, you know, how you do it and those types of things, uh, that would be kind of separate from this, but we could definitely talk about it. Those might also be things that other people in your facility, whether it's engineering or safety, have experience with as well. Um, so again, this is a team project. You're not, as the infection preventionist, the only one who is responsible for, for doing all these things and getting plans reviewed and occupancy inspections. So what you're saying is the nursing home administration should play an important role in those occupancy activities. Absolutely. Okay. I agree. Thank you. So this webinar will soon be ending, but we have time for a few more questions before we end the program. So if you have additional questions, please be sure uh, to add them. Amanda, in your experiences, have you encountered uh, construction activities that have gone way off the plan and how did you mitigate risk to residents if you did? I have not had anything that's gone, you know, really kind of out in left field. I will say there has been some times where unexpected things have happened. There was one project I can think of where I came to check on it and they had removed a hand washing sink and it was just a, a miscommunication and I think that really the key was the fact that I was there and inspecting the site on a regular basis. 
because I was able to recognize it as soon as it happened, and then you can have those conversations and we were able to quickly get it put back in place. So I, I think that the, the biggest thing is the IP that you can do is to physically be there and this starts conversations. You may find out something's going to happen before it actually happens, or you can recognize a problem as soon as it arises, as opposed to if you visit the site in the very beginning and then just at the end, you know, it's much more difficult to go back and fix issues when you've got all the finishing projects uh, and touches in place. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you experienced any issues accessing the evaluation and or certificate of continuing education, please feel free to direct any inquiries to Shelly Mixell at S-H-M-I-X-E-L-L-A at PA.gov. This concludes our webinar.